Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for being here today. I hope you're having a great morning. And we'll just go ahead and head over to the next slide. I wanted to introduce myself before anything. My name is Elizabeth Pena and I'm the Youth Engagement Project Coordinator at the California School Waste Health Alliance. And we'll just be going over um, some housekeeping so we could go on to the next slide. This webinar is being recorded and the recording and the slides will be posted on our website by the end of this week under the tab webinars and I'll be linking our website as well as the direct link to where our webinars are located. Feel free to explore that page. We have um, a bunch of other resources, upcoming webinars, resources that you should know about. And at the end of today's webinar, there'll be time for a Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to e enter any questions in the chat box. And today's webinar will run until 12 p.m., so about an hour and a half. And I will go ahead and link our Elizabeth, can you see? Are we good? Um, I cannot see your slides. Can everyone else, maybe? No. Yeah, so we can't see your slides, Bonnie. Uh, okay, hang on. Sorry, everyone. I'm going to stop sharing and share again. And Elizabeth, I don't see you anymore. Okay, do you see my slides? Not yet. Wow, I don't know what's going on. Sorry, everyone, we're having connection problems today. It uh, looks like your camera is off, Bonnie. There, how's that? Is that any better? No, it looks like I can't, um, I can't see them and your camera might be off. No, I see myself. I mean, my, it shows my camera's on, so. Okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. Oh, okay. Can um, anybody? There's suggestions in the chat maybe to um, log out and log back in. Okay, we'll do that. Sorry, everyone, I'll be right back. Okay, so as we wait for um, Bonnie, I'll just share a little bit about um, the California School Based Health Alliance in case anyone is not familiar. So the California School Based Health Alliance is a state nonprofit organization dedicated to the academic, the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. And so our work is really based on two concepts. Healthcare should be accessible where kids are and schools should have the services needed to ensure that poor health is not a barrier to learning. And we do this through capacity building, technical assistance, workshops and webinars like today. Um, and you can use our link to look at recording, slides and additional resources. And I can still hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you. Okay, fantastic. My phone is staying connected. It's just the slides. So the other idea was uh, if I send you the slides, which I probably should have done, because then you could hit next. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and works. do that. Yeah. Okay. And, um, um, Erica would like to confirm that marijuana will be covered um, during today's talk. Absolutely. Yeah. And feel free to ask questions about that as well. All right, everybody, I'm really sorry. I've never had these problems before. All right. Vaping will be covered a lot. All right, I am back in. Can you see me, hear me? Where are we? I can hear you.
I just Can cannot see, see I cannot see um, your slides and hang tight everyone we apologize sorry I've never had this problem before oh all right I'm going to email you the slides which is going to take a second but you were able to see the slides before so that's, do you see me because I see I don't see you over in an hour um, so please put questions in the chat and Elizabeth will um, save those for the end uh, unless it's a burning question that I totally confused you or if, if I'm losing you um, Elizabeth shout out Bonnie you're losing connection so let's get this going first of all I want to give a special thanks uh, to my funders and we are very fortunate to have both uh, grant funding and donor funding to be able to support the work we do I do want to provide two disclosures that are important. One is that I am an expert, a paid expert scientist in some e-cigarette litigation that's going on. And I am an expert in some uh, e litigation against the e-cigarette company. And then I am an expert in some city, state, and federal policies as well. So let's talk about, we're going to go into some of the different products. And by the way, when you asked about vaping, I'm predominantly going to cover vaping because that is really the product that we're most worried about with teens and then marijuana as well. So, of course, there are a lot of different tobacco products. You've got your traditional Marlboro or, you know, mentholated cigarettes, which hopefully menthol will be off the market soon, but you still, we still have those. We have snooze and chew that teens are still using. Teens are using cigars and cigarillos. Those are all being used in hookah. About 20% of teens are using hookah on a, on a social basis. But really, it's the electronic cigarettes that we're seeing is the most prevalent amongst teens. And most teens will initiate tobacco through electronic cigarettes. Now, you'll hear me say electronic cigarettes or e-cigarettes more than vaping. Let me just quickly give you that caveat. Why? Well, e-cigarettes are the term that we in public health prefer to use. Vaping, they're not vapes, they're aerosols. But we use the term vaping a lot because of um, that's really what the industry came up with. And we think that was true that they came up with that. So that way, um, when you, you know people don't call them a cigarette or don't equate e-cigarettes with cigarettes, but they are a form of cigarettes. I call it an electronic cigarette. However, and I'll talk about this at the end, when I talk to teens or to communities or parents, I will say vaping because that's what they're going to know and use. But just so you understand that. All right. So what are some of the e-cigarette or vaping products that we're talking about? You know, they came on the market starting with the ones that you see here that are more the cigalikes. They look like cigarettes. Teens weren't using these very often. They had nicotine. Most of them did. Not all. They had some flavors. They weren't the most efficient delivery device for nicotine. So we, and they look like cigarettes, so teens don't want to use them. Then we have these vape pens that came on the market, had a button, oops, excuse me, had a button on there. Those had a little more nicotine, more flavors. Teens were starting to use those a little more. Still not a big uptick. Then we had these in the middle, these mods, tank style, they're larger. These were the ones that gave that huge plume of smoke or aerosol that we were seeing. That's the one that um, we did start seeing more uptick with teenagers. But then Puff, uh, Jewel came on the market in 2015 at the bottom right. And that's the one where we started seeing a huge increase in the number of teens using electronic cigarette products. And then we had Soren and Puff Bar and other products come on the market, and we'll talk more about those throughout. So let's talk about the anatomy of an e-cigarette, the first e-cigarettes, and this is pretty much true of all of them. They all have some sort of a battery uh, that where you can charge. Some of the earlier ones had a battery. When, it was char when you were done with it, you'd throw it out. The newer ones had the battery, and you could recharge them. If you're familiar with Juul, for example, you recharge it into your computer or USB. I used to have educators a few years ago contacting us to say, there's something plugged into the kid's computer or the student's the wall in our school. What is that? And those were e-cigarettes. They have an atomizer or a coil. That's what you use to heat up the product, to heat up the e-juice that's in there. They have some sort of an absorbent material or cotton that you use. That, that is where you actually get the chemicals within. And then you breathe it in. And then again, you're breathing in an aerosol, not a vapor. So these are e-juice or e-liquid. They're small bottles, about yay big if you can see my, my hand, the size of maybe an eyedrop or, um, or eye drops, 
or nasal spray or something like that, these in there have highly concentrated nicotine and other e-juice. These are strong enough with enough uh, nicotine in there to kill an entire, if they ingested it, not smoked it, but ingested it, an entire class of kindergarten kids. One teaspoon has enough nicotine to kill one of us, uh, a small adult. So then we had Juul that came on the market in 2015 and others like Fix and, and came on and Soren. And those were what we would call the pod-based systems because they have a detachable pod. And these pods have a, um, you can see in here, this is the yellow. That's where the e-juice came. They're self-contained where the nicotine and the other chemicals in the juice is within the cartridge. Where it's self-contained. So you don't have to refill it with the bottle when you're done. You just throw away the pod and get a new pod. But the main device you keep and keep on using. These have the rechargeable battery. The cover usually has a color and that color denotes the flavor that's in there. And it's important to know that all of these pod-based have nicotine in them. And we'll talk um, a little bit about the kind of nicotine and why it's important. So let's switch over to marijuana. Let's talk about there are many different marijuana products that are on the market, as you probably well know, and let's go through those. So vaping or aerosolizing is probably the second most typically used marijuana product or cannabis product amongst youth. Smoking is still the, the, the most popular, although I think we're going to start seeing vaping taking its place pretty soon. So when you aerosolize a uh, marijuana you can do it a couple of different ways. You can buy a marijuana-specific vaping device, or you can take a nicotine e-cigarette like Juul and replace it, break it apart, and replace it with the marijuana leaves and marijuana oil. And we actually published a study. And by the way, anything I say, I don't give you a huge number of, of numbers and graphs. I talk uh, more generally, but if you're interested in any papers, I give you my email at the end please feel free to email me to ask for anything that I have. We, we are a lab of sharing. So when you're opening up, uh, we showed in our paper about a couple of years ago that about 20% of teens were taking Juul, breaking it open and putting in marijuana. And a quick YouTube search will tell you how to do that. So it's not very hard for teens to figure this out. So vaping, typically, you, you know, you're using THC, which is the psychoactive component, and it takes about five to ten seconds to feel the effect of that vaping, uh, of, of, of using the vaping uh, THC. And the high lasts about 30 minutes to even a few hours. The amount of THC concentration really depends on the liquid or the flour that you put in. And often, it's mislabeled, and that's actually a problem with all of these products, even the nicotine and cigarettes, it may say, you know, five milligrams, but it may have seven, or it may say no milligrams, and it may have three milligrams of nicotine. So we have to be careful. And then vaping marijuana is not harmless, and we'll talk more about that. Dabbing. Dabbing is the one that I'm really concerned about. And this is a highly concentrated THC, about 80% THC. That's multiple levels stronger than than just smoking it. It's also multiple levels stronger than when I was a kid and many of you were a kid. So this is the, the form that we often see teens winding up in the emergency room because they were dabbing this highly concentrated THC wax, and that's a problem. And then edibles. And by the way, I'm not going to talk about all of the THC products. Uh, you know, you're familiar with a lot of them, smoking or, or um, others, but I'm talking about the ones that we're most concerned about or most used for teens. So edibles. Edibles really are cannabis-infused food and drink, you know, your cookies, your brownies, your gummy bears. And there are problems with these. Uh, there are problems with all these, but problems with edibles that a lot of people don't think about. First of all, it takes 20 minutes to two hours to fill the effect. So if you think about, think about a Hershey bar, right? A Hershey's bar has different squares in them. If you know what a doses or uh, uh, one amount, one portion, it may be one or two squares worth of, of marijuana. The problem is, is that people, and this is people all overall, not just teens, but teens in particular don't realize that it'll take a couple hours or 20 minutes to fill the effect, whereas smoking can take a few seconds. So they eat it and they don't feel anything. Say, so, huh, maybe I didn't take enough. So they'll take more. Huh, still don't feel it. By the time they start feeling the effects, they're sick. 
They have taken too much. And often we're seeing people again here landing in the emergency room because they are taking, they're not going to die from it, but they can be very sick. And we're seeing a lot of nausea and vomiting going on because teens are taking too much marijuana. And part of it is in the form of edible. Also, and this is less so if you're going to buy a regulated product, although they're not very well regulated, and we can talk more about that. But if you're going to buy it in the store, generally the, the, the THC is fairly distributed equally throughout the product. But if you're going to make it at home, for example, think of uh, chocolate chip cookies. You know, you put in chocolate chip cookies, you mix them, your chocolate chips maybe um, are typically not evenly distributed. You'll have one cookie with more and one cookie with less. What's what happens with, with marijuana and, and home cooking edible products? And so you may have one that has a, too much of the THC and one that doesn't have very much. So that's part of the problem that we need to talk to teens about. Let's talk to you about just a few other products that have come on the market recently. We don't have any science on it yet. We don't know how many teens are using these products. We're actually launching a survey very soon to help us understand this. But I want you to be aware, so when you're talking to teens, you're uh, treating teens in your school-based health, health clinics, whatever, you're aware of these. So one is nicotine toothpicks, and these are just what you see here. They are toothpicks loaded with nicotine and flavors. Now, you're not going to have the inhalation um, concerns that we'll talk about in a few minutes, but, and, and, you know, we don't know what it means to just simply chew on it. You know, we're worried about uh, lesions in the mouth and cancer in the mouth, but we're not sure what else yet. But we're hearing more and more teens using these, and it may be an entry into other tobacco products. The other product that we're seeing that's fairly common is nicotine gum, and I'm not talking about the kind of nicotine gum that you use to, uh, to try to quit. This is not a nicotine replacement gum. These are starter gums, and they're called Lucy's, and they're very common, we think. Again, we don't have a lot of science, but in talking to teens, and they come in, you know, wintergreen and pomegranate and cinnamon, um, and, and this may be also an in, uh, entry into tobacco for young people. And then finally, we're starting to see the, all these new vaping products. We're seeing you can vape to, uh, you can vape nicotine, you can vape caffeine, you can vape melatonin, you can vape so-called minerals and essential oils. And they look like Juul you know, on the far left. Oops, excuse me. You can see they look like Juul and they, they come in flavors. And you could just buy these over the counter. In fact, Urban Outfitters was selling these. Uh, you don't have to be 21. We're really nervous about these because they have propylene glycol, they have glycerin, they have flavors. I'm going to talk about those chemicals in a few minutes. Anything we vape, anything we heat and inhale is harmful to our lungs. And teens' lungs are developing until their 20s. So we need to keep their lungs and their brains safe. That's a theme I'm going to talk about a lot. So we're not sure how many teens are using these and what the effects are, but we're very concerned and it's something that we're about to study as well. All right, so let's talk about use rates. Not of these newer products, we don't have them, but at least of some of the older products. All right, so let's first talk about tobacco and particularly cigarettes versus e-cigarettes. These data come from 2019, the National Youth Tobacco Survey. It's a national study of adolescents in middle and high school. I'm gonna talk about high school data for the most part but the trends are the same for middle. The good news is what we see on the far left panel, and that is the sharp decrease and steady decrease in the number of teens who are reporting using a cigarette. That's great. We're now in California well below uh, double digits. We're in the single digits. In some areas of the state, we're seeing five or 6% of teens using cigarettes. That's, that's great to hear. What's not good is what we're seeing on the right, this very quick, sharp increase in the number of teens reporting using an electronic cigarette in the past 30 days. And if you look in that time period between 2017 and 2018, we went from 11%, almost 12, to over 20% of teens saying that they used an e-cigarette in the past 30 days. That represented a 48% increase in the number of middle school students and a 78% increase in the number of high school students using these products. Uh, this is with the time when our then Surgeon General and our uh, US Surgeon General and our then FDA Commissioner, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, called vaping a teen epidemic. Then we saw in 2019, another sharp increase, almost 28% of teens reporting using an e-cigarette in the past 30 days. Now, a couple things important to know. I actually think these numbers are lower. 
I, uh, or excuse me, are low. I think the real numbers are higher. Why? A couple of reasons. One is the way the questions were asked, they didn't ask about Juul or Juuli. They used e-cigarettes such as Fix or Soren or Blue. Teens weren't using those. Teens are calling Juul, Juuli as if it's a separate product, a separate thing. So I think these numbers are underestimating. Uh, and when I also go talk to, it used to be in person, now it's, it's you know, through Zoom, but I would go across the country talking to teens. Teens will say, no, no, it's more like 40, 50, 60% of the people in my class, my friends are using these products. Now, the newer data, the national data from 2020, show that we may start to see a decrease in e-cigarette use, and that's great. So it looks like we're closer to 20%. However, again, that 20%, was what we saw in 2017 to 2018 when this was coined a vaping epidemic. Plus, these data were collected at the beginning of the pandemic in January to March of 2020, and then the data collection had to stop. We don't know what the rates uh, would have been if we continued or if the, the federal government was able to co continue collecting data. We have no idea. We also show, and I'll show more about this later, but we also have data showing that teens were quitting during the pandemic, partly quitting because they're worried about lung health. That's fabulous. Also, during the pandemic, teens weren't socializing as much, right? And these are social products for teens. So teens aren't at school. They're not having parties. They may be in their backyard using, but they're not with these big groups. So part of our decrease in use may be because they're not hanging out together. What we found is that teens who were most addicted, though, for those who are not quitting. And so we still do have a problem of addiction that we need to deal with. And we'll talk more about that. All right, cannabis use. The latest data we have for cannabis that's been published are from the uh, 2019, uh, looking at the monitoring in the future in uh, also middle and high school students. And what you see here is if you look in green, you can see almost 44% of you saying that they've used an e-cigarette at any point in their life and 6% saying that they're using daily. It's amongst 12th graders. But even 8th graders, you're still seeing pretty high levels of youth using some form of cannabis. If you look at co-use, what we also see is it's very common for teens to be using both products, for teens to be using uh, some form of tobacco and some form of marijuana. Sometimes it's in the form of vaping, both. Sometimes it's in the form of a blunt. A blunt uh, is a cigar or that where somebody has taken out the tobacco that's in it and put in marijuana, or they may just take the cigar wrapper and then put marijuana in there. You're getting a double whammy. You're getting both the problems with the tar and the nicotine and everything else that comes with the cigar wrapper, which is a tobacco product, and with the marijuana. So we're seeing a lot of co-use. And when we talk to teens, it's important to talk about co-use and lung health as a whole. So we know from some data that uh, we and others have published that about 33% of high school students who have you ever used an e-cigarette reporting reported using cannabis in their e-cigarette. That's true for 23% of middle school students. And youth who vape are three and a half times more likely to use cannabis than those who don't vape. So having the conversation and, and you know, hopefully with this talk and, and thinking about this, talking to teens about lung health in general and vaping in general and not just focusing on nicotine or cannabis, but making sure that we talk about all products. Now, I do want to mention um, Puff Bar in particular. This is our latest product that we're, that, uh, in terms of nicotine. This was actually a picture that I took of vaping products that uh, one school district gave me of a bunch of things that they had confiscated. And if you look carefully right here, I think I have one more picture. Yeah, we see Puff Bar as the product that teens are using most often. If we have time at the end, we can talk about the problems with the FDA regulation as well as California regulations that's going on, can talk about that and talk about why Puff Bar sort of snuck in. I do want to also point out that this school found a lot of vaping cannabis products. So, and it's really, really hard to tell the difference. You have to look very carefully. So to be aware of these products. All right. And this is a, just a quick video of another school district who just showed me all the products that were confiscated. And again, you could see how many of them were cannabis as well. All right. So 
So what's in these e-cigarettes? So switching to nicotine now. So if you look across all of the different e-cigarette products, not just Juul or Puff Bar, but all of them, you'll see these. And by the way, a lot of these slides, particularly the cooler ones, come from our web, from our tobacco prevention toolkit or our cannabis toolkit. Um, and I always joke, the boring slides I made, the really cool slides my lab made. So, um, you know, if you're looking for some of these slides to be able to use to talk to youth, they're in the toolkit. But I'm also happy to share any slides with you. Anyway, this is a slide showing all the different chemicals that are in the e-cigarettes. And that's either in the liquid or in that plume that comes out. You know, I used to, I've been doing tobacco prevention work and tobacco research for 25 years. I would show slides like this for cigarettes. E-cigarettes are not that different. Are they more or less harmful? You know, it's really hard to know. Specifically, a lot of people are saying that e-cigarettes are just different kinds of harms. We're very worried about lung and heart, and I'll show you more about that. But there are still a lot of chemicals in these products, like acetone or acrylene or formaldehyde or lead or cadmium. Very, very concerning. It's also important when you're talking to anybody, particularly if you're a policy person, to realize that e-cigarettes are tobacco products. Now, there's some question about PEFBAR and whether they're doing some synthetic nicotine, um, and we're still trying to figure that out. But generally, for example, Juul, Juul uses nicotine. It uses Nicotine comes from tobacco, so e-cigarettes are tobacco products, and that's important to think about. All right, cigs in a pod. When we talk in, to teens, it's really important to try to talk to them about, you know, e-cigarettes or vaping has a lot of the same ingredients that we see in a cigarette. Because cigarettes are not popular with teens, which is great. We published a study a few years ago showing that teens don't like cigarettes. They realize that they're harmful. They realize that they're bad. They, they're not socially normative anymore. So the more that we can say e-cigarettes are very similar to cigarettes, the more likely we are to help teens prevent and stop using e-cigarettes. So the question is, how much nicotine is in these e-cigarettes? Now, this is a slightly old slide. We're actually going to modify it because there's some new data that may suggest that that's not necessarily the truth of what it is, and I'll explain that to you. But as you may know, a pack of cigarettes has 20 cigarettes in it. What you may not know is each cigarette has about 8 milligrams of nicotine in there. Now, but what you get into your body or what's called the yield, how much you actually breathe in, is closer to about one, one and a half milligrams of nicotine. So what does that mean? And when you've got a pack of cigarettes and you inhale it all, you're probably, if you finish the whole pack, probably getting somewhere about 20, 25 milligrams of nicotine in there. A jewel pod has 41 milligrams. If you just do the math, you may be getting closer to two packs of cigarettes. Having said that, there's some new literature that's coming out that may suggest that you're getting more like one to one and a half packs of cigarettes. We're not really sure, but regardless, there's a lot of nicotine in these jewel pods, whether it's one or two packs worth of uh, cigarettes worth of nicotine, it's a lot. Puff bar is a little bit more, fill it 50 milligrams, and Soren has closer to 90 milligrams in them. Now, what's important to know is that these newer products that I'm showing you here have a salt-based nicotine. So what does that mean? The older products, older e-cigarettes and cigarettes have what's called a free-based nicotine. Free-based nicotine uses uh, 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 sugar and ammonia to bind to the nicotine and the chemicals and let it to go through your body and into your brain. It takes about seven to 10 seconds for that process to happen. Now, if you think back to your litmus test, sorry, we do a lot of math and, and uh, uh, chemistry in this talk. So sorry to torture you with chemistry for a minute, but think about your litmus test back to chemistry 101, right? You think about that and it goes from acidity, um, from acid to basic, right? So when you're thinking about a cigarette or the older e-cigarettes, the free base nicotine, that is very basic. It's a very strong basic, but really basics are very harsh in your, in your throat if you breathe them in. So if you're thinking about a basic, um, when, when if you've ever been a smoker and you know people have, they inhale a cigarette or an older e-cigarette and they get what's got throat hit. I've never smoked, never used these products, but I'm talking to a lot of people, they get that kind of tightened, strong, basic throat hit kind of feeling. Well, if you're a teenager who's never used a cigarette before, which again is most of our teens, most are starting with e-cigarette, 
and you start with an e-cigarette that has the free base nicotine, you're not going to like it very much. You're going to cough. It doesn't, it's strong. You don't like it. What Juul did is they patented a salt-based nicotine, and salt-based nicotine is now being used in a lot of other products, uh, e-cigarette products. This basically added uh, salt or in the form of benzoic acid to move that litmus test, uh, move the scales more towards the acid, more towards neutral, really. And so when you breathe it in, you don't have that throat hit. Plus, it gets absorbed faster. So it's part of why we're so concerned that teens like these products and why they're getting addicted so quickly. When I ask teens, how much, how many pods are you using in a day? And we publish a paper on this. It's anywhere from a pod a day to a pod a week. So, you know, a pack of cigarettes or more per day to a few cigarettes a, uh, a day over a course of a week. Teens who are addicted tell us that they're using anywhere from one to four pods a day. That's one to eight packs of cigarettes huge amount. So it's why we're really concerned about these products. All right. We're also concerned about THC. As you probably know, the amount of THC that's in these products and THC is addictive to teenagers, to anybody, but particularly teens, while our bodies are still developing. The THC is 10 times the THC when you know, my grandma or your grandma or you or I were kids. It's very strong. Weed is getting stronger and stronger over time. And it's being bred that way. It's being farmed that way to be highly, highly concentrated. All right. So if I haven't convinced you enough, why else are we concerned? Well, the body when vaping, and by the way, this is not just vaping nicotine. This is actually smoking or vaping anything. Nicotine and THC rewires the brain. Now, nicotine is the most addictive substance, substance that is out there. Nicotine actually rewires the brain. And let's talk about this a little bit more in a second. Nicotine also makes the heart beat faster and also causes trouble with your lungs. And we'll talk about that. All right. So nicotine, what is it? Why are we worried? It's a highly addictive substance. It actually causes a change in the brain chemistry. So teens' brains are developing, right? They're developing until your mid-20s. That's one of the great things. But as your brain is developing, your brain is saying, huh, what else out there do, can, I, can I continue using? What else out there do I want to use? Um, uh, and and what, what do I need in terms of the synaptic changes in your brain? So your brain says, huh, I see um, a, a synaptic connection. Do I need it? And if I don't, I'm going to prune that away. You've heard of pruning away the connection. And then I'm going to myelinate or smooth over the connections that I need. Well, we're born with nicotinic receptors. We're born with the ability to become addicted to nicotine. If we don't introduce nicotine into our bodies until we're much older, then our bodies are great. We don't need this. I'm going to get rid of it. But if you introduce nicotine, your body says, great, I'm going to change and I'm going to stay and I'm going to keep that connection in my body. So it actually changes. It also stimulates pleasure centers and alters the normal brain function. So now your body is craving the nicotine to feel pleasure, but it's not a real flip pleasure. It's a fake pleasure, and your brain is confused that way. All right. So what about the nicotine effects beyond that? We also know that nicotine slows the development of learning, memory, attention, and behavior. And by the way, so does, so does marijuana. Also, mood disorders like anxiety and depression are linked to nicotine, and it can permanently lower your ability to control your impulses. And we also know that teens in particular who are addicted to one product are significantly more likely to then become addicted to another product. The adolescent brain develops from the back to the front. And in doing that, we know that the parts of the brain that develop first, the amygdala, and the parts that are more responsible for motor coordination and physical coordination develop first. So we're more emotional, we're more coordinated, but the part of the brain that's responsible for thinking and decision-making and executive function develops late, later. It's why kids are like, yeah, I want to try something new and, and to get that, that emotional stimulation going. But nicotine alters that process. And it's why we know that adults who are addicted to nicotine, the majority, 90% or 88 to 90%, depending on the literature, started before the age of 21 and before the age of 18. It's why now across the country, the law of the land 
signed into law in December of 2019 by the federal government is that you have to be 21 or older to be sold a nicotine product. And that's true for marijuana too. I didn't want to skip that um, video, but I can share it with you. There's a good video on why waiting till 21. Um, so let's talk about tobacco and the lungs now. So we know that tobacco in any form of inhalation causes inflammation and irritation of the airways of the lungs. We also know that it destroys the air sacs in the lungs. We also know that tobacco changes the immune system and weakens the immune system and makes you more vulnerable to infection. This is why uh, physicians don't like to do surgery or procedures on adults who are smokers because it's harder, particularly elective surgeries and procedures because it's harder to heal. I actually know of some hospitals that now don't want to do procedures or surgery on teens who are vaping for the same reason. So there are a lot of concerns about what vaping and tobacco in general is doing to your, to your lungs. The flavors themselves are also concerning. We're going to talk more about the flavors in a few minutes, but we know that these products have, for example, vanilla, vanilla or um, diacetyl. Diacetyl is the buttery flavor that we see in microwavable popcorn. There's also pulene that is in the mint and menthol, and that is a carcinogen. Um, there's also cinnamon aldehyde, a cinnamon flavor. These are coined by the federal government as grass, general, generally recognized as safe for oral, but not for inhalation. So you can heat butter or vanilla or, or, di, um, or, or uh, cinnamon or popcorn or anything and then eat it. But if you heat it to three, four, five, six hundred degrees, which is what e-cigarettes do, and then you inhale that aerosol, there is plenty of literature to show that that is harmful to your lungs. So what about COVID? Well, we know, as I showed, that vaping and smoking weaken the lung system, uh, the lungs. We know that the novel coronavirus attacks the lungs, so it stands to, to, to uh, make sense that if you have weakened lungs, you're at greater risk for getting COVID. Now, most of the studies have been on adults and on smoking. And most of those studies show that if you're a smoker and you get COVID-19 or diagnosed with COVID, you are significantly more likely to be have severe, uh, severe COVID, to wind up being hospitalized, and to die. We did a study that we published in August of 2020 in the Journal of Adolescent Health that showed it was really the really was and still is the first study of adolescents and young adults, 13 to 24, that showed that if you are vaping, you're also significantly more likely. We didn't look at symptoms. Or excuse me, we didn't. We looked at symptoms. We didn't look at severity, but you're significantly more likely to have uh, severe effects from vaping. Oh, sorry, I'm saying that wrong. We didn't look at uh, severity. We looked at presence or absence. So if you were a smoker and or a vapor, you were five to seven times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID. So why? We don't know if that has to do with, we don't know if that has to do with lungs. We don't know if it's because I was saying that it's a social event for vaping with teens outside in the backyard, even though they were sheltering at home where they with their friends and sharing their vaping products. Um, taking their mask off, if you're sharing your mask off, you increase your exposure. You may touch a doorknob and then touch your vaping products and touch your mouth and more likely to expose yourself to COVID. So we don't know why, but we definitely know that there is a strong relationship between smoking, vaping, and COVID-19 across the ages. All right. Well, what about cannabis specifically? Well, we know that also cannabis has effects my slides are coming up weird, they have effects on the brain as well. So cannabis alters your brain. Um, it also makes you feel more anxious, paranoid, slow reactions, and poor memory. We also know that it can cause inflammation of the cells and of the lungs. There's also something called hyperemesis of teens who are coming to the emergency room because they're feeling sick and they're vomiting a lot. It's because of cannabis. So the brain, a lot of people say, oh, oh, cannabis is not addictive. Yes, it is. It also can impair your learning memory. Some people call it the stupid drug um, because it actually lowers your IQ points. It interferes with sleep. And the higher dose and the more regularly you use it, the greater the impairment. 
And the brain problems that come with it don't just resolve when you stop using. So we need to talk to kids about brain and lungs. Again, very important. If you're using marijuana, we've seen effects on cough, increased phlegm, lung illness, lung infection, um, immune cells, and lung cancer. So all problems that we're seeing with, with vaping or smoking cigarettes, they are there with marijuana as well. And in terms of inhalation, marijuana smoke is, comes from biomass combustion. It has thousands of chemicals in there, including very fine particles. And this is true, by the way, of vaping as well. So when you breathe in, you're getting these little particles into your lungs and deep into your lungs. And that's part of the problem. So, um, and again, blunts, not only are you inhaling, but you're getting both the marijuana and the nicotine and tobacco all at once. So there was something that you probably have heard of, Evoli. This was, uh, came about an e-cigarette or vaping product associated lung injury or Evoli. This is an example on the left of help, healthy lungs and vape injured lungs. And unfortunately, the CDC stopped collecting data on Evoli in February of 2020 for good reason. We did have COVID come on, come on and, and that was more important to keep track of. But unfortunately, we don't know any updated numbers of Evoli. We knew that there were almost 3,000 cases, almost 70 deaths across the country. Evoli seemed to be mostly linked to vaping THC, the vitamin acetate. That's the oily substance that binds to the product to bring it into your body and into your lungs and into your brain. That seemed to be what was clogging up the lungs and causing this lung disease. But we do know teens, and this was teens and adults, by the way. We do know teens who have said, hey, I've never used a... um, I've never vaped marijuana. It's only been e-cigarettes, and they also have Evoli. We just don't know enough about it. But I do know, and I don't know about you if you've still seen it, but I have friends who are adolescent medicine docs and pulmonologists and lung docs who are saying that they're still seeing and treating Evoli. It presents similarly to COVID, but that it is different. And so that's something to be aware of. And really, if you're seeing somebody and talking to somebody who is coughing and feeling sick and they're a vapor, Obviously, get them tested for COVID, but don't don't forget to also check for your volley. It is a very, very serious lung disease. So I've already said it, but cannabis can be addicted, and a lot of people think that it's not addictive, and it's something that we have to really work hard at. And, you know, we're in a real uphill battle with marijuana. You know, we have Prop 64 that uh, came into law a few years ago, and um, when I used to go to the Warriors games in person with my husband, we'd walk, walk around and go, mm, smell that? There's Prop 64. Um, you know, it's, it's everywhere right now. And so it's really hard and we're in an uphill battle to try to stop young people from using or at least delay or reduce when it's legal. But we always say it's legal, but that's for 21 and above. And I'm worried about you and your brain and your lungs under 21. And that's how we talk about it. All right. So we do know also that uh, vaping is associated with suicidality. Uh, We see that a a 50% increase in suicidal ideation uh, and about 3.5% in actual uh, uh, trying to actually commit suicide amongst young people who are using these products. And we also know that if you are using marijuana and you are prone to psychosis, schizophrenia, and so on, that you're more likely to then be diagnosed. There seems to be a relationship, particularly in the brain, where it sort of snaps you over if you're already, it's not every teen, but if you are somebody who's prone, then it can snap you over to um, to actually suddenly have a psychotic breakdown and being diagnosed. So that's another thing that we talk to teens about is, hey, you may not know whether there's mental health issues in your family and it's not worth uh, chancing it. All right, second and third hand smoke. I get a lot of questions about that. So secondhand smoke from cigarettes, absolutely, we know it's an issue. We know if you're standing next to somebody who is a smoker, if you live with somebody who's a smoker, you are more likely to get all the same kinds of diagnoses and problems as somebody who is a smoker. But secondhand aerosol is similar. We know that if you are standing next to somebody who is vaping, you are more likely to get the effects from the nicotine. There is nicotine in that aerosol that comes out. There are heavy metals and ultrafine particles that, again, you could breathe in if you were standing next to somebody who is a vapor. 
There are cancer-causing chemicals and volatile organic chemicals, so all kinds of bad stuff that we're seeing, propylene glycol, glycerin, a lot of those same chemicals are in that secondhand aerosol. We also know that there's something called third-hand smoke and third-hand aerosol. So if you're breathing in the aerosol and then you breathe out that plume of either cigarette smoke or aerosol from the from the e-cigarettes, it goes into the air and it changes in the in the chemicals. It changes in the air and lands on on uh, on the floors, on the carpets, on the drapes, on the walls. And if you have a little kid around who's crawling or using their hands and picking stuff up or a pet, they can be ingesting. And these are toxic materials. Okay. And marijuana is, is no different. Marijuana also contains a lot of chemicals when you're talking about that secondhand plume or smoke that comes out. It has cadmium and chromium and benzene. It has over 33 chemicals that are on the California Prop 65 list of toxins in the air. And it can have very strong effects to the cardiovascular system. This is secondhand, not primary smoke. Children who are next to mar marijuana that's been in the air from parents or others are having detectable levels of THC and exposure, headaches and dry mouth and so on. So really the same effects that we're seeing. And it's why when we talk about you know, um, uh, uh, clean air, indoor and outdoor air laws, and we're talking about multi-unit housing, it's important to consider and look at laws and policies for all forms of in inhalation, whether it's um, e-cigarettes, cigarettes, and marijuana as well. And probably we're going to see the same with these so-called wellness vapes, these, you know, melatonin and things like that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about why youth are using, and then I'll end with a little bit of resources, and we will have time for questions. So youth are using these products for a lot of different reasons, but I'm going to focus on a few. Flavors. By the way, it's your turn to participate. I have a couple of fun things for you to put into the chat, and Elizabeth will shout out what, what you're saying. So flavors. First of all, we know that teens use flavors. Almost 90%, 87% of youth in the National Youth Tobacco Survey say that they are using a flavor, particularly fruit flavors, mint flavors, and mint and menthol. And middle school students are also using these flavors. Teens tell us that they use it because of the flavors. They like the flavors. The flavors mask the harsh taste of the tobacco. So if it tastes like mint or menthol or candy, then and it doesn't taste like tobacco, then it must be okay. If it smells good, if you've ever been near somebody who's vaping, uh, I had a, a, a brother-in-law, ex-brother, or not ex, uh, half-brother-in-law, who vaped um, creme. It smells good. It doesn't smell like tobacco. So I often say to parents, look, if your kid's room smells like bananas and mango and blueberries and strawberries, it's probably not fruit solid. It may be that they're vaping. So it smells good. So these flavors risk a mask the risk. If it smells good and tastes good, it must not be harmful. And teens are saying they try because of these flavors. And if the flavors are not available, they may switch products. So they may, this is why we need comprehensive flavor bans. We, if, they, if fruit is not available, they'll switch to mint or menthol. If mint or menthol vapes are not, a, are not available, they'll switch to mint or men, menthol cigarettes because they want their the flavors. And if they're addicted, they're gonna keep switching until they find a product. And they'll even use uh, tobacco flavors if they're addicted enough. And the packaging and the ads, and we'll show you these, I'll show you these in a minute, also are very attractive to young people. All right, so pop quiz for you. Put in the chat, how many flavors of vaping products do you think there are across all products? Not just Juul, but across all products. And here are some examples. 15,000, 1,500, 50, 3,000, 1,000, 120, 20K, 8,000, 15,000, thousands, 500. All right. You guys are too, good. I can't trick you. I like this one. Too many. Um, <laughs> too many. Yes, way too many. And by the way, when I'm in person and I show this slide, a lot of people go chicken and waffles. So if you're saying it out loud, I heard you. I heard you. Um, because I'm so used to that. All right. The first one was right. 15,000 flavors across. 
And when you talk to the tobacco industry and the e-cigarette industry, they say there was a great CNN uh, 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 reporting on this a few years ago where the industry was saying, no, no, we need these flavors to help adults quit smoking cigarettes. Well, first of all, there's not good evidence that adults quit smoking cigarettes through e-cigarettes. If we have time, we can talk about that. But we're talking about youth here. Again, youth are initiating tobacco today through e-cigarettes. Adults don't need unicorn poop, sugar booger, honey doo doo, um, uh, dragon's blood. These are youth flavors. These are not adults flavors. These flavors are attracting our kids. And we actually published a study where we asked teens, what flavor is this? And is it attracting and appealing to you or people older or younger? And the flavors teens say, they're attracting me. They're attracting people my age. All right. So flavor is really important, and it's why, uh, you know, I've been a big proponent of flavor bands, so we could talk about that. All right, another pop quiz for you, easy to hide. So these are some of the, um, yes, it comes a watch, a vaping product in a watch, but it's really easy to hide these products. How many vaping products do you see here? Give you a second to count. Okay, Elizabeth, how many are we seeing in general? If you want to shout See, out just a few. Six, four, five, two, three, eleven, five. Wow. All right. The answer is six. Curious. So the eleven. That was pretty cool. All right. This was taken in my office uh, pre-COVID. And right here you've got the jewel. Right here you've got Soren, two vape pens in the box. This is your little pod here. And STIG, which looks like the USB, is another popular, uh, or was popular, I'm not so sure anymore. These are meant to be hidden. Look how small the pods are. They're the size of a quarter or a small paper clip. When I talk to parents here, too, they say, I didn't realize that my son or daughter was vaping until I found a little pod. or this, They didn't know what it was, this little plastic thing that came out in the laundry. Um, I hear teachers and school resource officers saying that they're, they'll search a kid and they'll find it in their belt buckle or in their shoe. They're really little and so very easy to hide. When we ask teens in a couple of recent publications, why are you using these products? They'll say because they are easy to hide. That's part of the problem. Marketing. You know, and this goes fast, uh, but if, if you look at all these packaging, it's really hard to see how much nicotine is in there. The Jewel early on said 5% strength. What does 5% mean? And what do they mean strength? They didn't tell you till later that what it meant was nicotine, 5% nicotine. It wasn't until later that that came on. So 5% of what? 5% is 41 milligrams of nicotine. Nowhere on there does it say how much nicotine does now. It did not early on. And this is part of the problem as well. Here's some of the packaging that we see. They're made to look juice boxes, you know, really cool, really beautiful, very attractive. This is not an adult product. This is attracting our young people. Social media, we saw this of things like, will you marry me with a jewel? Or would you go to water or to jewel pods? Or youth-focused ads, these were really sad. This actually is not just youth focus, but during COVID, when it was really, well, it's still during COVID, but early on was really hard to get uh, masks and other PPEs. Then it was Soren was saying, buy a Soren product and get two free masks. And that was really sad. Access. I told you, in California, California actually passed a law raising the age to 21 to purchase a tobacco product in 2016. It became the law of the land across the country in 2019. This picture was taken in California saying local discounts, student discounts. The majority of students are under 21. This is attracting our young people. Teens are price sensitive. If you say, hey, if you're under 21, um, come on in or come on in, teens are going to come in. And I don't know where you live. I won't shout out loud where I live. Um, you never know who's not listening. I get, I get a lot of... Uh, hatred by the tobacco industry. But we're in my city where I live, I get emails from parents saying my 17-year-old and 18-year-old went into the local vape shop and was able to buy these products. They're not being carded. They're also cheap. A puff bar, a dollar to two fifty. A pack of cigarettes is about ten bucks. 
look at how cheap these products are, or Jewel $5, or guess what? You can buy one and get one free. These are um, actual pictures taken in a California county. CBD, very easy to find. And then finally, misperception. So adolescents think that these products are healthy or are fine. And, and you know, if you said to me, Bonnie, you have no choice. You're, you're backed up in a corner. You have to decide between a Juul or a Puff Bar and cigarettes. I would take the e-cigarettes. They're probably a little bit less health, less harmful. But we're talking about, as, as a colleague of mine, Dr. Brian King at the CDC says, jumping from a you know 15-story building or a 20-story building, the effects are still the same. They are not that much less harmful. And again, with teenagers, it's not e-cigarettes versus cigarettes. It's e-cigarettes versus air. And that's important to realize. Plus, teens think that they're not addictive. They don't understand. They say, oh, it's just harmless water vapor, just flavors. There's not much nicotine in there. No, there's as much nicotine, if not more. And it's the kind of nicotine, the salt base, that we're most concerned about. So in summary, these are products that are stealth. They're easy to hide. They're youth-focused. They have very high levels of nicotine. They're salt-based, so less throat hit, easy to use. There are misperceptions about these, about the amount of nicotine and the harms. They come in flavors and youthful flavors. The packaging and the ads are attracting our young people. They're cheap, and they are harmful. So in short, we have to protect our kids' lungs and brains. So what can you do? Just going to give you a few recommendations. And I know my team is going to be training you uh, more later, right, Elizabeth, on, uh, on things later to specifically use some of our resources. But talk about tobacco. Teens will say, we did a publication where teens say, well, you don't talk about marijuana in your cigarettes, so it must be fine. This is before our toolkit. But, you know, so if we don't talk about it and put our head in the sand, they think it's okay. If you or your patients or your parents are using these products, don't use them around young people. It normalizes it, and there are harms from second and third hand smoke. Encourage adults and teens to talk to a healthcare provider. There are ways to prevent and stop using these products. And keep them away from kids because they are, the juice themselves is dangerous. Find the right time. It's not a lecture, it's being patient and saying, you know, I went to a talk today and I heard about these products. I'd like to talk to you about it, son, daughter. What do you know? You may not be able to get them to admit whether or not they're using right away. That's okay. It's a process. Use terms like vaping and jeweling. And it's not, hey, we need to sit down and talk. Um, and don't say things like, you don't vape, right? Because what are they going to say? No, I do. They don't want to disappoint you. And my feeling, this is my philosophy, I am a parent of, of a 21 and 25-year-old. My 21-year-old um, was the one who started telling me about Jewel. Uh, she and her friends, when she was 16, she's of the age that we're most worried about. And, you know, what, what I would say to her is, if you're doing these, I'm not, and I don't think she was, but if you are, I'm not going to be mad at you. I want to get help, you help. So it's about getting help to young people. So there are e-cigarette resources out there. Um, there are no nicotine replacement therapies that are approved for anybody under the age of um, 21 uh, or under the age of 18, excuse me. But there are still plenty of healthcare providers prescribing nicotine replacement to patch uh, so, and, and with good success. And we'll, that's on one of our websites where we talk about this. But there are, there are plenty of one 800 quit now and, and no vapes and, and the this is it through the truth initiative, a lot of good vaping um, cessation products that are out there. We do have, and, and thank you, Elizabeth, we'll link to these, our three toolkits uh, that we're really excited about. The Tobacco Prevention Toolkit is uh, started in 2016. It's to help prevent and also stop all tobacco products with a particularly large unit focused on vaping. Uh, we have reached 1.8 million youth across the country that we know of. We think there may even be more, used in thousands of schools. Visit is our, uh, and the Cannabis Awareness Toolkit is also, these are more for educators to be using and parents. Visit is the latest, just came out. It's a vaping information solutions and intervention toolkits. This is for healthcare providers. So this um, toolkit for healthcare providers to be able to give you information to help you screen, counsel, and treat your patients who may be using vaping in particular, we'll expand it later. 
So, and that one is still being built. There's a lot more that we're building, but it is there for you to check out. We do have online courses. So if you're not yet in person, or if you want to just give students a course to take on their own, we do have online courses and they're more gamified. They're really fun. They have fun quizzes and they help young people learn. And then if you have a young person who was caught vaping in school, for example, or if you're a parent, we do have Healthy Futures that moves teens towards quit. It's an alternative to suspension. It uses motivational interviewing techniques with the idea of helping young people quit. So I want to thank you. And uh, Elizabeth, should I stop? Do you want to do the next, your slides, and then I can stop sharing? Well, we can go ahead and go into Q&A. Um, I, I have a few questions from the chat that I uh, was able to. And feel free to enter more in the chat. We do have plenty of time for Q&A. So in reference to co-use, is co-use just when tobacco and cannabis are being used at the same time? Or does this also include using tobacco and cannabis as separate products, although during the same time frame? You know, it's a fantastic question. And it's actually a paper that I'm hoping to write at some point soon, because yes and yes. Um, Co-use can be used as a blunt or vaping both product, both nicotine and THC in the same in the same vaping device at the same time. Typically what we mean are people who are using both products sometime over the course of a month or a week. You know, it's, it, there's not good data. There are not good data right now to say, is it, you know, over the course of a day or the course of a week, you know, maybe using a vape uh, nicotine one day and marijuana the next day. Um, Co-use, by the way, can also be polyuse, which is multiple nicotine products. So we know that teens, some teens are using, and I didn't show you a slide on this, but teens who are using vaping products are um, about three to eight times more likely to then go on and use a cigarette. So that's another form of polyuse or co-use. We know that sometimes they'll use in class a vaping product or chew because you can hide it, whereas maybe in a car or with friends, they might use a cigarette. So um, there's just not a lot of good data to really tell you when and where uh, those definitions are, but I'm sort of using them interchangeably. Thank you. And the next question we have is, how do we help young people get off using these products? They have already started as a way to cope, how do we help replace one behavior with another? What is the first step? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not a huge harm reduction person, although I am a little bit with the marijuana, you know, it'd be what our philosophy has been, let's try to get you not to use it all. And then if you are using, let's try to get you to quit. And if we can't do that, at least to cut back, you know, using motivational interviewing is a good technique. And we have those on the visit website, uh, you know, talking to them. Oh, and then healthy futures too. What are their goals? What, you know, if they're, if they're an athlete, it's great because you can say, you know, vaping, anything really hurts your lungs. And not a good time if you're an athlete, you're going to hurt your time and your productivity as well as the team. So, or cost. These things, you know, even though they're cheaper than cigarettes, they're still expensive and marijuana is expensive. So what else can we be doing with your money right now? How can we help you um, cut down so you have more money to spend on fun things or go to amusement parks or other things like that. So it's, it's hard because teens don't, you know, a lot of teens will say, oh, leave me alone. I'm enjoying this. Or why are you so worried? It's not a big deal. And if we just talk about the harm um, and, you know, we don't know about cancer yet. It's, these products are too early. So it's hard to say, well, you know, you're going to die or you're going to be really, really sick. But if we can appeal, and kids don't care about that. If you can appeal to the things they care about money, you know what, Johnny, you're being duped. Do you realize that they put mint and menthol in these products or they put in a solution that's salt-based so you'll like it? That they're purposely getting you as a replacement smoker. They're purposely attracting you at 13 or you at 16. Sometimes those techniques help as well. There's no one solution, but try to get at their goals and help move them towards slowing down and quitting. Um, if they are willing to quit, trying the nicotine replacement patches for, for nicotine. Marijuana, we don't have a lot of good medications for marijuana. There are good therapies um, that people are using. By the way, I work with a psychiatrist here at Stanford, and he has seen patients if you, um, if, if you are, um, uh, if you're interested in, in um, therapy for anybody who lives in the Bay Area. 
Thank you. Um, and these are all really great questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, and so as they're coming in, the next one is, what can we do about the medical loophole for marijuana access to those who are 18 plus? Our radio ads now state that 21 plus for adult use, but 18 plus for medical. Yeah. Um, talk, to your, talk to our legislators. Let, let's get action going. And if you're interested, I do, as Elizabeth said, and as I mentioned, I do a lot of policy work. Um, you know, it, it's a big concern. Uh, we should be starting to um, uh, really say that medical marijuana, you know, the, the biggest problem, I mean, if you're, if you're a cancer patient, although there's mixed evidence as to whether marijuana really helps, my husband's a, an oncologist, there's pretty mixed evidence on whether vaping really, or sorry, marijuana, um, whether it really, um, uh, whether marijuana really helps if you're sick. It, it does help you gain weight if you're really thin because it definitely gives you the munchies. But the question of whether it really helps you um, is, is out there. But in terms of medical marijuana, if you're 16 and, you know, here in our pediatric cancer facility, a lot of times they'll recommend marijuana, then at least let's get them not to inhale it and get them to ingest it in different ways. So I think if we can change our medical marijuana laws to be stricter, it's really, really easy to get a medical marijuana card no matter what your age is. So we need to tighten those loopholes and make it really difficult for any age to get a medical marijuana unless they really need it. And what we really should be doing is try to get the inhaled medical marijuana changed so that is more CBD or more concentrated into a pill form or, or a... Um, um, put on your skin and absorb it as opposed to inhale because inhaling if you're a cancer patient you shouldn't be inhaling anything it is dangerous please follow up if i'm not quite answering thank you thank um, you bonnie and elliot asks can you direct us to the research that shows the most effective effective cessation products there is not research on effective cessation products for teens there is no good literature. Most of the literature either doesn't exist, the randomized control trials, the gold standard studies have not been done, or if the, if the few have been done, don't show very good effects for teens around nicotine replacement. It's more empirically, it's more like docs have prescribed it and for you know any given patient. So at a population level, we don't have good data, but in my docs here in Alice Medicine, They'll say I prescribed it, and generally Johnny's doing better, or you know, so and so person's doing better. So um, there's just not a lot of good evidence. There is good evidence. There was a paper recently published by the Truth Initiative that there, this is it. Cessation uh, um, text line is doing is is working well. It was a randomized control trial, so there is evidence. There's evidence for our, some of the work that we do around prevention. Uh, but not on, on the, the cessation products yet for anybody under 18. Sorry to disappoint you. And I will, um, all, thank you so much for everyone that shared links. All the links that were um, shared in the chat will be included in the email that we'll be sending to um, everyone that registered and attended. And the next and thing we have, the, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, when I get better internet connection um, in a little bit, I will send you the slides and you're welcome to share those. Thank you. Um, and someone asked, are there sample talks or presentations we can present to teens? And I was thinking about the um, tobacco prevention toolkit. Yes. Yeah, there are. So in the tobacco prevention toolkit, and, and um, for those of you who can attend, you will be trained on using that. And by the way, I'm not selling you anything. All three toolkits are completely free. They're all online. I get people emailing me, can you give me the toolkit? No, it's not something I hand you. It's online. Um, and things are downloadable or clickable. It's all on there. And we do have full slide presentations to talk about all the things. So there's a whole presentation on vaping. There's a whole set of, a set of presentations on the brain and nicotine and addiction, a whole um, – uh, a whole bunch of information on there. So we also have activities for those of you who are in clinics, school-based clinics or teachers. We have posters um, across all three websites. We have posters, they have PDFs that you can print and put across your campus or in your in your rooms. Um, so please take advantage of all those. They're absolutely free. And and also, if you find a broken link. Or, bro or something we said wrong, visit was made uh, fairly quickly because we wanted to get it up and it's not done. We really, really want feedback. So 
Um, broken links or errors we fix within a day. Wish lists, we try to get on there within a few months, a few days, depending on, on what it is. But we are trying to um, uh, stay in where everything we've done is trying to help you all. Our community is who are need. And also, by the way, on the tobacco prevention toolkit, somebody, I saw ASL. We don't have ASL in there, but we do have Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese is coming uh, I think French is coming, so we are translating as much of our toolkit as funding and time allows. Awesome. And um, someone asked, Bonnie, you can please elaborate more on the THC triggering a psychotic break for teens. Yeah, it's a really good question. I, you know, if you email me, I can probably find you some literature, and it's in the toolkit. I don't know a lot more about it. Um, uh, to be to be honest, I but I know what I do know, and I can say sort of generally is that if you're a teenager or a young adult, it's more in that like 17 to 21 year old period. It's not every teen who picks up a joint or or a vape with marijuana is going to suddenly um, be psychotic or or be more likely to have schizophrenia. Um, but you, um, uh, but it's more like if you are already at risk then you're more likely to sort of trigger it. So it's like your body is sort of primed to becoming schizophrenic. You may already have that sort of laying low, but then there's something about the chemical reaction between the marijuana and your brain that triggers that to happen. Will it, would it have happened anyway? I don't think we know enough about it. But um, if you send me an email, I can see if I can get our adolescent medicine doc and psychiatrist to give me more information. Awesome. And someone's asking if there are um, classes available in other languages, and they had American Sign Language in, in mind. So, boy, I used to use it yourself, um, or I learned it in college. I don't remember as much. Um, we don't do, uh, when you say classes, you mean like a, a talk like this or the training. We do them in English. We have a couple people in my lab who speak Spanish and may be able to do that. What we also could do is if you, I, I did this once with a, a parent group. It was very cool. There is a, a way to do um, either closed captions or translation on Zoom. You can set it up that way. And I did it in English. And then somebody on a different channel was actually translating what I was saying in real time into Spanish. And you probably could have that. If you um, know somebody who does ASL, I'd be happy to give this talk again and then have somebody overlay it. So we just don't have the capacity in my lab right now to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bonnie, for answering all these amazing questions. Um, and someone's asking for the Healthy Futures link, and we'll be sure to send all links um, together and packaged together along with the slides. Okay, I think we can go ahead and um, move forward. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to email Bonnie and I, and we'll go ahead and close out with our last few slides. So um, CSHA wants to invite you all to our 2021 virtual statewide school health conference. Please save the date. Um, it will be November 2nd um, through the 4th. And um, I also wanted to mention that, I, and I also linked those in the chat, our upcoming, our upcoming webinars are, can always be found online, but it's specifically for this month, we have two more webinars trainings. Um, wait, wait, sorry. One, <laughs> Not sure which one. You're fine, you're fine, we're good there. Um, and one is with the Stanford University and it's a training on how to use the tobacco prevention toolkit. So that's coming on, up on June 18th. So, uh, please register or share with anyone that you feel might be interested and can benefit from this training. And the second one we have is June 29th um, and it's uh, being put together by Contra Costa County Office of Education on youth engagement, leadership and advocacy in tobacco use prevention and intervention. So I'll, I can go ahead and link those one more time in the chat, but again, um, you can always find our upcoming webinars and um, past webinars and trainings on our site. And I wanna encourage you all um, to, if possible, to become a member of the California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, and I will link the chat in the chat as well, but there are lots of benefits. So conference registration discounts, 
member only tools, resources, and technical assistance tailored to your organizational needs. Um, and I invite everyone to go ahead and click on our page and learn more about our membership. I'm just going to go ahead and link the webinars as, as well as our. Trainings. Okay, and before our time together comes to an end, I want to ask all attendees to please be sure to complete the evaluation that will automatically pop up at the end of the webinar. It has five short multiple questions. And again, thank you all so much for joining today. We invite you all to join us for our upcoming webinars that are in our 2P series. And we hope that you're staying safe and healthy. Um, and please feel free to email us if you have any other questions. Thank you all so much for joining. And I'll just be linking our membership link shortly.